Summers and Aaron Foss who worked so hard to make this possible. Today's lunchtime talk was sponsored by MAP's Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and tonight's reception is hosted by the Architecture Program. I am proud to be a member of both of these groups. This exhibition was mounted in concert with the AIA Women's Leadership Summit held in Washington, D.C. this past September. I had the pleasure to attend, and I was impressed by the content. But that was to be expected. I expected the content would be high. But perhaps what has really stayed with me was realizing that this was my very first experience of ever being in a room of 400 other female architects and knowing that that room was matched by a ghost room of at least 300 other women who were turned away just from this part of the country. And it was national, actually. There were people from all over. Something unimaginable when I was a student and one of my first female professors at RISD recall what it was like to be the only female student in all of her five years at Cornell. There were so many women, in fact, that a slight temporary spatial adjustment was necessary to accommodate them. <laughs> so one way to vanish the lines at the women's restroom. So in all seriousness, looking at this past helps us to imagine our future. We're now working on our next show, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the school. We're now thinking about where have we come from? Where are we going? How will we get there? The transformation just in my own years from being an undergraduate student with one female professor and maybe 10 out of 75 of us in, at RISD as females to a student body now which is split pretty evenly is unbelievable. And so as we now look forward to the next 50 years in our fields, what is it that we would like to see? What if? What then? Um, there's a team of us in the school comprised of faculty, students, and staff who are working this semester to gather content for the 50th exhibition. Um, you'll see posters around. We're going to have an event probably in about a month asking you guys to think about what are our aspirations? What are our goals? Where would we like to be? And rise those goals and rise those thoughts into and embody in the exhibition that we will host um, and put on in the spring. So this is a bit of a heads up. We're using the opportunity of this exhibition, which looks back to help us move forward um, in a powerful way and expand our own definition of who we are um, as we consider who we want to be. And with that, I'd like to introduce our two speakers. It's really, um, again, this is such a great thing to get to do. I think I have the best job ever. Um, Paula Zellner. Um, Paula is the designer and curator of the show that's in the gallery. She's an associate professor at the School of Architecture and Design at Virginia Tech. She's the secretary of the International Archive of Women in the Architecture Center. She's a faculty fellow of the Institute for Creativity, Arts, and Technology at Virginia Tech. Paula Zellner graduated from Universidad de Buenos Aires and practiced architecture in Argentina and Uruguay. She obtained a master's degree from SciArc, practiced in Los Angeles with Norman R. Miller Architects, and together with Jim Bassett, started Zellner and Bassett, receiving in 2010 the AIA Blue Ridge Award of Excellence. She taught at Woodbury University, the University of Michigan, and as I mentioned, is currently an associate professor in Virginia Tech and member of the executive committee of the International Archive of Women in Architecture. Her collaborative work includes installations, the Book of Lies, for artist Eugenia Butler, uh, Between the Pyramid and the Labyrinth for Moss Art Center in Blacksburg, Reclaiming Space at the University of Manitoba, Luminescent Forest at the Horton Gallery, and 30 by 30, which is now showing in our gallery, but was originally shown at the Biennale Internacional de Arquitectura in Buenos Aires, among others. Her scholarship has been published in Museum Making, Narratives, Architectures, Exhibitions, um, that was published by Rutledge, and the journal, I'm not going to get this, Vita Coma, 
Architectura, I really have to work on the Spanish accent. Number 33. Donna Dine is a collaborator, um, a fellow of the American Institute of Architecture. She's the chair of the International Archive of Women in Architecture Center. She's an ACSA Distinguished Professor, the G. Truman Ward Professor of Architecture, School of Architecture and Design at Virginia Tech. She has contributed a significant body of work constructing linkages to education, history, architecture, and planning, emphasizing the dimensions of professional and civic responsibility. As chair of the IAWA, Donna Dine has studied the, build, the, studied the IAWA to build worldwide knowledge of women in architecture. Then is showcasing her exhibitions created from the collections include glass ceilings at the Virginia Center for Architecture, for the Future, the International Union of Architecture Congress in Tokyo, the International Congress of Women Architecture um, in Tokyo, Toulouse, Bucharest, and Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. Uh, in 2015, she led the IAWA and hosted the 18th um, Union of International Female Architecture Con Congress, which was themed contributing to the constellation in Washington, D.C. and Blackford, Virginia. Virginia Tech is the home of IAWA's growing archive of over 400 collections of archival materials. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Paula and Donna, and I'd like for you to help me by giving them a hand. And, and thanks for having us both, you know, throughout the semester with the, uh, the piece showing in the gallery and, sorry, <laughs> um, for inviting us to, uh, to give a talk about the work. Um, let me see. Okay. So I'm going to go through this uh, presentation. It's going to be part reading and part showing images, so I hope that you can uh, follow. Um, the International Archive of Women in Architecture emerged as a response to the need for a balanced history of the discipline by making visible the contributions of women in architecture and preserving the work or research. Uh, the IWA was founded in 1985 by Dr. Milka Cherneva Lishnikov as a joint effort between the College of Architecture and Urban Studies and the University Libraries of Virginia Tech. Born in Varna, Bulgaria in 1927, Lishnikov earned her master's degree from the State Polytechnic University of Sofia, Bulgaria in 1951 and practiced architecture for almost a decade before escaping Bulgaria to France. The legend says that she escaped Bulgaria by swimming in the Black Sea across the border to an international ship that took her to France. So a, re a recent visit to the archive searching to validate the story uncovered an article where she declares, quote, I was quite a swimmer. I used to think that would be the way I could escape, by swimming to Turkey. It's about 50 miles, end quote. Instead, she bribed someone to smuggle her aboard a boat taking vacationers on a Mediterranean cruise and jumped ship in France. Lishnikov arrived to the United States two years later in 1961, knowing very little English. While practicing architecture, she furthered her studies on Soviet architecture, receiving in 1971 her PhD in architectural <coughs> history from Columbia University. 
Lysenko's academic career began in 1972 at the University of Texas, where she co-founded the Institute of Modern Russian Culture and continued at Virginia Tech, where she joined two years later the faculty of the College of Architecture and Urban Studies. As an avid researcher of Soviet architecture and the avant-garde, Lysenkov was aware that women in Eastern Europe and Russia had enrolled in architecture courses as early as 1904, and that during times of war, revolution, and uprising, women had played the vital role of builders, rebuilding, for example, after the Second World War, the towns of Germany and Russia almost single-handedly. It was, therefore, from the perspective of the educator in the, in the United States in the late 1970s, that the absence of women precedents in the history of the discipline became strikingly apparent to Vlishnikov, who promptly res resolved to counteract it. She explains, quote, the omission of women's contributions neglected for so long needs immediate rectification. And above all, since most women were and still are reluctant to promote and publish their accomplishments, their archives must become available for future generations to evaluate, end quote. Perhaps more striking than women's reluctance to promote their work is the realization that the media coverage had given until re relatively recent times little to no credit to the work of women. This fact ultimately shaped the mission of the IWA. She continues, since women's work was seldom mentioned by the press, the archive of the designer herself becomes the only source of information further highlighting the importance and urgency of preserving women's originals, pa original papers. Um, so I'm going to go now to the, the main goals um, and mission of the IWA. So in 1983, two years prior to the founding of the archive, Blishnikov began contacting women architects throughout the United States and Europe by sending over 1,000 personal letters and traveling to several countries. In the template letter preserved in her archive, dated July 9, 1985, Lishnikov underlined, quote, the scope of the archives will be international and will include work from the beginning of women's involvement in architecture in any capacity up to the present time, end quote. Women have not always been allowed to attend college to obtain a professional license or to practice. Many had nevertheless contributed to the built environment for centuries in different capacities and were owed due credit for their contributions. For this reason, the archive was named the International Archive of Women in Architecture rather than International Archive of Women Architects. The template letter lists the three goals of the IWA. The first one, have to read it, yes. Search for archives of those of our women colleagues who are no longer living and whose works will be dispersed if not collected immediately. Second, appeal to retired women colleagues to donate their drawings, letters, photos, and anything else connected with their work for both professional and private life. And third, appeal to active women colleagues to donate their earlier work and bequeath the rest of their archives to the International Archive of Women in Architecture at the College of Architecture. This letter acted as an invitation and was, at the time, the only dissemination tool. <coughs> Later, in the fall of 1989, the first issue of the IWA newsletter was printed, broadcasting the IWA to a larger audience. <coughs> the newsletter lists the major goals similarly. However, the first goal is notably edited to read, to find and preserve the records of the pioneer generation of women architects, also referred as the first generation. The term pioneer described the women who lived and worked in the early 20th century and alluded not only to particular work they had produced, but also to the impact their practices have had on expanding the arena for women in the profession and the discipline. <coughs> Anne Kaiklein serves as an example. An active women's suffrage advocate photographed leading in March in 1913 Kaikline was the fifth woman to receive an architecture degree from Cornell in 1911, and the first woman architect in Pennsylvania to register in 1920. Her patented inventions include, among others, a space-saving sink designed for apartment kitchens from 1912, a bed for apartments in 1929, the versatile cake brick from 1927, in addition to 13 known architectural projects and as many requiring verification and documentation. Yasmin Ladi falls in the pioneering category as well, becoming the first registered woman architect in Pakistan as late as 1963. 
The initial newsletter lists two additional major goals for the archive. To serve as a clearinghouse of information on all women architects past and present, and to encourage research on the history of women in architecture through seminars, exhibits, and publications. Both goals indicate an expanded clarity of the scope and the potential of the IWA beyond acquiring and preserving the work of women toward an increasingly generative role of fostering research and broadening the dissemination of the contribution of women to the discipline and design-related fields. By 1987, two years after its establishment, the IWA had received the works of 28 women, and by 1989, the archive held the records of 98 women organizations, including, among others, Hans Schroeder from Netherlands, who grew up in the famous Ripple Schroeder house, and Donna will speak about here shortly, and worked in Rickville's office before establishing her own practice. And Guy Olent, the architect and interior designer from Milan, Italy, the Lucé d'Orsay in Paris, France, being one of her major architectural projects. In 2015, on its 30th anniversary, the IWA held over 400 collections. Although a sizable archive of its kind, the acquiring rate of the early years has lessens, lessened. The process for acquiring collections is lengthy and complex. Yet the urgency increases as women of the past century pass away, asking that efforts be redoubled to collect, quote, whatever records still remain. So, Explore architecture. 
when Johann uh, Hahn, Erna, Elsa Schroeder, one of the first women licensed to practice architecture in Holland, was asked, it must have been very inspiring for you to grow up in the most unique house at the time, she responded. Now she knew Milka, she knew Milka Wershenkopf. So this is, the reach back in all of this is very fascinating and you should explore, each of you should explore your own possible reach back through family, friends, but anyway. Oh yes, she responded. Uh, my mother kept um, transforming the interior of the spaces daily because the sliding partitions could be moved very easily. In those formative years, growing up in one of the world's first modern houses, the De Stiel Schroeder Riefeld House, she was making chairs with Garrett Riefeld as a girl of eight. <coughs> she and her mother collaborated on this house, as we know now. She explored architecture and the extension of space. She learned of the dynamic need of the eye for more space than the entire body. I presume, she says, that my approach to design, namely trying to create the best possible background for specific tasks to be per performed instead of accepting an interior as a thing in itself, is rooted here. The spatial openness found in her projects, like the structure of Japanese space, underscored what was being shared. In 1993, Hans Schroeder was an inspiration for the International Archive of Women in Architecture, when she donated her entire professional archive, creating the foundation of the IAWA collection. What you see here, um, yes, yeah, yeah, might go back. What you see here in this photograph, that's Han as the older girl in this particular photograph. This was the house she grew, grew up in. Many of you have probably studied this already in architectural history. Um, these three, the images together, the silk screen, this photograph, and then the next one, which is a sketch in her own hand. And it's phenomenal to come across. She knew of the place she was living in and the quality of that place, obviously by being in direct contact. And for us to have the reach back I met her, I didn't know her as Milka knew her, but that possibility uh, enlarges all of her, our lives. Her archive shows that she was not only privileged by her association with Refill, and this is her sketch. See the Refill chair there? You see it there? And those of you that don't know it should look at that. Um, with Refill, uh, she was not only privileged by her association with Riefeld, but by her mother's committed disposition to architecture as well. It was indeed my mother who commissioned Riefeld in 1923 to design the house, and it is a fact that she became so strongly in, involved that her share of the design of the interior can no longer be separated, as we know in many cases, but certainly in this one, or clearly defined. This account sheds light on the fact that her mother's contributions to the discipline, which result from challenging the conventional model of domestic living through this particular project, she made discoveries undiscovered now and known to few, few known by few to none. Her mother, as some of you may or may not know, was a widow and she had children and she sought this path to make this special house a special house that would enlarge her children's lives. Um, this is a letter from Riefeld, uh, um, I won't read the whole thing, but it's a to whom it may concern letter with uh, Riefeld in 1965, introducing Miss Schroeder to future possible employers and what they might expect of working for her. She was on her way to this country and ultimately first first stop um, was, was New York Institute of Technology where she initiated the, their department of interior design. Here's a house of hers from Geist, Netherlands. Before she left, she did this work. Um, I think the, 
you take a moment to study the plan, it's a beautiful critique of houses being built actually today. The interior of that house. Just look at this corner and then go back to that plan. Can you locate where that corner is? Over in the upper right hand. Really beautiful. Um, with the materials in the IAWA, the uncovering through representations bring important resources to construct the study of architecture. Um, Rietveld conveyed this, of course, in his To Whom It May Concern letter. He said, I gladly state that I have much admiration for her work, which has reached such a high standard in the design of buildings and interiors. Apart from a skillful handling of space, her work is straightforward and well balanced, and it also proves great interest in the habability, habability of building and in the practical needs of the occupants. Uh, the whole set of this work answers a question that all of us could pursue if we wish to. Here's Hung um, herself in her office working on it. Uh, working on a model, but if I go back, and it's an incredible revelation of very, very small project of how to bring a kitchen into a room. Okay, what does a student portfolio look like? So this might be on some of your minds. Uh, a gift of a mother's portfolio from her two sons to the IAWA, acquaints us with the work of Lilia Scalia, one of Austria's first female architects. Lilia Scalia had fled the Nazis in 1939 with little else than her <coughs> architectural work in her student portfolio from the University of Dresden. Now, now known more for her acting than her architecture, Scalia had appeared on Broadway and in television and in many films including Lily's Out the Field, opposite Sidney Poitier, garnering, garnering an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actress. Her life became the subject of the one-woman play Lilia, written and performed by her granddaughter, Libby Scalia, first performed in New York in 2000, and continuing on today, I might uh, make the remark that for the celebration of the IAWA's 30th year, we invited Libby to come to Blacksburg and perform this in the Lyric Theater downtown. Exciting moment. For a young student from, from Austria, Lilia Scalia found architecture gave her the freedom to seek beauty. Her student portfolio testified <coughs> dimension she was uncovering for herself a priceless collection of drawings of mathematical constructions um, and rendered perspectives along with examples of spontaneous vigorous freehand work all speaking to, of her capabilities of prowess. I think the range is, is quite interesting and complex and does answer that question what should have portfolio <coughs> interior perspective so she had capabilities where you could see why uh, her aspirations to become an actress were fulfilled when she came now how do you gain that understanding and architecture as a way of life when we meet another person with that question, Eleanor Pedersen. You probably haven't crossed paths with her architecture. She uh, was an important woman in the profession of architecture in this country because she achieved a number of <coughs> She was the first woman president of the AIA New Jersey chapter. She was an early inductee into the College of Fellows. Here she is in her office. She ultimately, through a bequest to the IAWA, donated her archive, which consisted of 600 projects. 
This is a project she did later on in her life. It was a renovation of a house for um, President Nixon, who had gone into retirement after his presidency, after he had stepped down. But I like to show you this project because it shows the the bigger of her practice. It was a personal house. This is in Saddle River, New Jersey. She somewhat liked this barn. And as you can imagine, if you came across such a structure, you might have dreams of what it could become. She made this drawing and then made this transformation, which became her own home. It was widely published. You see how spatially it's um, developed. Now, the question mentions a way of life. She was an apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright and then attended Cooper Union. There's a lecture given every year in her name. This is the interior of the house. <coughs> there she is. One thing we don't show you this evening, very interesting, it happens to many people. They may have a mother who is distant but needs their help. This house underwent a transformation <coughs> so that she could accommodate her mother living with her. And, and oftentimes older people have other requirements. If you visit the archive, you see the two sets of plans that she developed to bring about that possibility. And I'll conclude these four little questions. Who was the first woman licensed to practice architecture in the Commonwealth of Virginia? And her name is Mary Brown Channel. Perhaps it was Mary Brown Channel's work whose, whose life's work uh, almost disappeared from history. A passerby, a student of architecture, and so that places you in those feet as well, seeing particular things being carried out of the house into the garbage, knew by his brief glance and limited observation that the house was being cleaned out. But then he spotted something particular that he knew very well. He saw rolls of paper. A simple question confirmed what he suspected. These were the work of an architect someone's mother. Her work now saved for history in the IAWA, along with an evolving story collected from her son, who did not know of what was being tossed in the garbage. The architect started her own firm when her son was born because she had to leave her professional office. Uh, it could not be, in her time, a mother and also be in a professional situation. She lived to a notable age of 98. Since Mary Brown was not permitted to attend architecture school at the University of Virginia, which she had always hoped to do, following her brother's footsteps, she went on to Cornell where she garnered the Baird Medal, graduating in 1933. She was certainly a pioneer, likely the first woman architect in the state of Virginia. Can you imagine if we didn't have her archive? <laughs> that it ended in the garbage. The drawings, dusty and grimy, obviously from the attic setting, organized in a box with a string matrix divider woven from a single string, were the materials that would illuminate the life work of Mary Brown Channel. She was a pioneer. So we celebrate these stories. We invite others to celebrate them. Paula continues this tradition with the fragments that she brings together in the 30 by 30 that you all are aware of and will tell us more. under a broad definition of architecture that includes interior design, landscape architecture, industrial design, graphic design, urban design, and urban planning. Within the collections, around 345 belong to women 
representing 47 countries. 100 of these collections hold a complete work of the practice of women architects, for some including the totality of the professional correspondence and contracts with clients and contractors, like the example of Elsa Levisseur, who was born in 1942. Together with personal papers, professional stamps, drafting, and lettering set, lettering sets, like the collection of Jane Hastings, born in 1928. The remaining 245 collections fall in the category of small collections, some holding as little as a single <coughs> item. The collection of Louis, Louis Blanchard de Thun, born in 1856, serves as an example holding only one postcard dated 1907, featuring the Thun's Lafayette Hotel in Buffalo, New York. Another notable example is a collection of Eleanor Code from London, born in 1733. Coates' collection holds only her trade card of her business, for her business, which she ran from 1769 until her death in 1821. Her business manufactured artificial stone, referred to as Coates Stone. <coughs> the stone was used among other projects in the refurbishment of the Buckingham Palace in the 1820s. At present, this is the oldest item in the IWA archives, thought to be printed around 1784. In privacy and publicity, Beatrice Colomina compares the contrasting attitudes of Le Corbusier and other flows toward the archiving of their work, where Le Corbusier, building his legacy, preserved excessively, while, quote, Laws ordered all the, all the documents in his office to be destroyed as he leaves Vienna in 1922. Describing the process that Rochtieu and Schaffel underwent when writing the monograph, out of Laws, Life and Work, Colomina suggests that their book, with all its gaps, is the Adolf Loos archive, underlining how much the gaps in Loos painstakingly reconstructed archive reveal about Loos and his practice. Similarly, the gaps in the IWA, although resulting from different circumstances, reveal much about the discipline as a whole and the past both allowed and disallowed, as well as those adopted by women around the world. While the items in the collection are evidence of and affirm the work of women, the gaps in the archive given by missing collections or by blanks between fragments in a collection can become productive voids that spark the imagination and foster curiosity and inquiry. Archive and history are not the same, Colomina writes. The archive is private history. The archive is private, history is public. Once history is written, quote, the messy space of the archive is sealed off by it, end quote. However, in the space between archives and history, lie the stories inspired by the fragments, scribbles, memories, and informal conversations, and the gaps. As Elliot Jaeger Kaplan writes, quote, these stories too are fragile but necessary contingent ingredients of archival work. They are the private process that is erased as soon as it succeeds in producing a bit of truth, end quote. Kaplan refers to the stories produced by the imagination of the archivist or researcher while exploring the archive. She continues, quote, if there are values to be protected in the archives, they belong to this realm of passion, where intuition and coincidence turn random documents into results, end quote. So now following, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna look at some more fascinating uh, stories that uh, grow out of fragments that exist in the archive that are waiting for researchers to turn them into a history. So this relates a little bit to what you were talking about, Renée, a while ago. Uh, this is Melita Rodic, and she says, many years ago, when she was a student of, arch of architecture at the University of Vienna, in my class there were only three women among 90 plus uh, men. And in her collection, we find these fragments that you know, tell some stories, but we don't know that, again, the history has not yet been written. So the design that I have it for, images that she would produce related to uh, religious beliefs. Uh, Lydia Spada, we just saw again some of her items in her collection. Vita Roque Burai, who I was talking about uh, today in the gallery talk about her, her fear of her professor uh, coming to her to talk about her work when she was a student and her desire to be a, a writer, uh, to read and write, um, 
she says, I never shall be known and famous. I, I shall unfortunately continue to live unknown like before. A little girl and the persons who misunderstand her vocation. And still, I stop. The um, so little beauties like the archive collects all sorts of items, including <coughs> personal journals, travel journals, sketches, <coughs> drawings, etc. Kimiko Suzuki from Japan. Due to the economic conditions of Japan following World War II, and she could not find work in an architecture office. She instead joined a publishing company because she was promised the same salary as a man. And her work is just exquisite. If you look at these drawings, uh, they're all graphite drawings, you can really sense the pressure of the lead against the paper. <coughs> And this was a beautiful find. This is on the back side of one of her elevation drawings uh, on traits. So it's part of the uh, populating the, ele the elevation drawing with trees and cars and so forth. This car is probably an inch tall. And it, can, it shows her love and her passion for her work. She takes you know, the time to even mark the windshield wiper tracks. And that, I'm going to draw this one inch tall. Um, so these are a few of the many fragments that tell uh, stories. Uh, again, stories told by fragments or by women about themselves and about other women. In some cases, that is all there is. A tenuous memory, a brief comment, an autographic program, all fertile fragments. As Kaplan concludes, the gold is all in the dust. So now I'm going to talk more specifically about the, the Lufa Congress and the production of the uh, exhibit that's in the, in the Cuddle Gallery. Um, so in the summer of 2015, reflecting on the first 30 years of the IWA, the executive board members began to articulate a vision for the following 30 years. The goals and the mission as defined by Blishnikov have not changed and remain necessary. But the means of dissemination and publication require substantial upgrading and development to extend the reach and exposure of the IWA, promote its growth, and encourage research. Digitizing the physical collections, therefore, has become essential to the expanded vision, a task currently driving two projects, projects the digital exhibit 30 by 30 and the new visual archive project that you see here. Um, so engaging the digital landscape, the new visual archive project, currently under development, development, continuing development, is a portal to the digitized collections, allowing users to access remotely images of the holdings, rather than accessing only the listings, which is the case now if you go to the IWA website, you can see all the collections and all the items in a collection, but in list form, not in a visual um, form. Using the portal does in no way replace the experience of the physical interaction with the original work, yet it aids researchers away from Blacksburg in advancing research while publicizing the IWA. Uh, the exhibit 30 by 30 employs the digital content differently to showcase the archive and its mission and to invite a broader international audience to contribute to its growth. Conceived not as an art piece but as an invitation to explore the archive, 30 by 30 uncovers fragments seeking to fuel a passion for discovery that could yield truth. It also becomes a demonstration of the role that fragments and gaps have in manifesting a latent history of architecture as the archives await becoming actual history. Resonating with the archive's fragmental nature, the totality of the images selected for the piece have been deliberately cropped framing small areas of specific content, inciting the viewer to read into them and extract essential in the times ephemeral bits of information about the architects, like the tone on a personal letter, the character of a trace, or the thoughts captured in a spontaneous scribble on a margin. Like this is a piece I had forward. And I had looked at it several times, but then one time I just looked at it closer and I saw this little note at the bottom, something to dream about. And I thought that that was just a, a wonderful moment to, to talk into that, uh, understanding her as a, as a practicing architect. 
The exhibit premiered during the 10th WIPA, 18th WIPA Congress hosted by the IWA in July 2015, themed contributing to the constellation. Installed in a black box theater at the Mall Art Center, the multi-story dual projection piece communicated spatially the less tangible aspects of the archive and of the practice of women, as well as the gaps in the archive, its incomplete state that continues to highlight the relevance of its mission. One of the most important considerations uh, for the exhibit was the incorporation of scale. 30 by 30 distinguished itself from traditional exhibits of this content, typically in the form of printed panels, by creating instead an immersive space of contemplation and reflection. The size of the screens allowed images to be cast at architectural scale, projecting the viewers into the space of the images and inviting them to have architectural experiences of the selected photographs and drawings. The space dimly lit by the luminous surfaces of the projections together with the ambient soundtrack enticed visitors to slow down and while immersed in the work reflect on the diversity of contributions women have made to the discipline. Introducing 30 women from the archive, the non-linear yet looping structure of the exhibit makes use of a script platform that allows for variation each time the presentation completes a cycle. Mikhablishnikov, being the founder of the IWA, appears first on every cycle, yet the order of the remaining architects randomized is randomized to express that all collections, large and small, are relevant and equally precious. With this scripted uh, structure, the original first folders can without difficulty be substituted for new ones as collections are digitized, allowing for the production of different and multiple exhibits with greater ease. There is currently an increasing number of sites, groups, and organizations striving for the visibility of women's contribution to the built environment and for professional equality, like women in architecture, Carver uh, from Australia, architects, Undio Nafitecta, and the Beverly Woods Architecture Foundation, among many others. The IWA, while sharing this mission, is the institution preserving the dust. The physical work of women that supports research and must therefore continue to uncover and, and acquire it before it is dispersed. The 30 by 30 exhibits support these goals by broadcasting, educating, and inspiring individuals to contribute to the constellation. The 30 by 30, as Renee mentioned, has shown in Argentina during the uh, Biennale de Arquitectura in uh, 2015, it showed in Ireland in a smaller format uh, during a, a, a whole Ireland architecture research group um, symposium. Uh, it is currently showing at the AIA National Headquarters uh, in parallel with the exhibit here in Maryland. And we are thinking about the next um, stages or, uh, of travel. Uh, we are continuing to develop the script so that we can have simultaneous um, openings. Uh, and we're looking to uh, go across the United States uh, and the world. Uh, since the uh, 30th anniversary, we have uh, the energy that was generated through the organizing organization of, of the Congress uh, propelled us to do to start many other initiatives, um, amongst which we have the uh, annual symposium. So we have the annual symposium in 2016, 2017, and we're getting uh, ready for next year's. Uh, end of March, we're going to host the 2018 symposium. We have uh, organized exhibits in special collections so, so that you can, people can actually come and see um, some of the artifacts that we have in the, uh, in the collections. Uh, we have also started an in initiative with uh, LALI, which is a Latin American landscape, uh, in, not, not initiative. Latin American initiative. Initiative, thank you. Uh, trying to uh, uncover and um, preserve the work of Latin American uh, landscape architects. Uh, and that has already produced, uh, opened up, uh, and started the process for several collections. Uh, the call went out in three different languages to try and capture English, Spanish, and Portuguese, to try and capture Latin America. Uh, we also started the IWA group which began as a special 
study group, but it's moving toward um, a course, which is really uh, an action group. This is the first group of students that have graduated from that, have gone through that course and have actually graduated and are now out in the, uh, in the world of practice and continuing to expand the network for the IWA, searching for new collections. Um, with them, we have organized the series that we call Fire in the Library, where we invite, uh, for example, the Milka Vishnikov Research Prize uh, awardees to talk about their work and their experiences in the archive. We have also started the IWA uh, Instagram. So I definitely invite you all to follow us. We have currently over 1,200 followers and we post weekly the work of uh, a woman from the archive. Um, we have contributed entries to this blog, which is a, a blog in Spanish. It's the, it has just started its third season where we post every day the work of, uh, of a woman architect. Uh, so they have over, I don't know, like 700 posts already, and we have, the archive itself has contributed material for their entries, but the, um, the IWA group has contributed uh, entries themselves for, for the blog. Um, and we are working on new projects. Um, this is a standard name for it. Uh, hopefully it's not gonna be the final name, but we're looking to see uh, who of the of the work the collections that we have, who of those women are still alive and, and bring them to the archive and have them talk about the work and record their oral history, um, their memories and any other kind of information that may not be present in a set of drawings or other items in the collections. And we're also uh, hoping as we move with the uh, forward with the symposium that we will be able to pretty soon uh, launch the IWA journal. But those are some of the initiatives that are uh, going on at, you know, in the efforts to expand the reach of the IWA. And I'm going to leave you with this, just as a suggestion to go ahead and follow us in, uh, in Instagram. Um, we have one more thing. For the, uh, the 30 by 30, the, the, the 30th anniversary of the Leaf Out Congress, we produced this card that accompanied the exhibit that's outside. Um, the card is written in four languages, and it basically asks you uh, to write your personal uh, contact information. And then here to write suggestions of collections that, that you think we should pursue. That you may know someone that knows someone, or maybe your grandmother, or your aunt, or your neighbor's mother is an architect. Um, so we are not, I mean, of course we try to preserve everybody's work. Uh, famous women are easier to find. Women that are not as famous are not as easy to find, so we rely on sort of word of mouth or you know somebody who knows somebody um, and providing that information so that we can reach them and hopefully preserve the work so that the history can be written. Um, we brought a few of these. There are outside uh, by the door of the gallery, so if you are inclined, please pick one up, even if you don't know a name or something right now, but it's good to keep it, and if later on you think of somebody, you can fill it up, and then we have our information mailing address here, so you can send it to us, or email us, or uh, comment on Instagram. Um,
So we don't need to worry so much if we say you know someone that's bringing the archive. Uh, yes, we're focused on the pioneers, uh, but it's interesting how you find a pioneer. There are many pioneers. We are interested in collecting single works, a single drawing. We have a postcard also of Zaha Hadid. Uh, we have not gone after her archive. We are not <laughs> interested necessarily in the stars. It's fine if the star wants to be their archive. You saw the image there of the architect Barbie. The Mattel Corporation sent architect Barbie. Despina Stratagakos was instrumental in their being an architect Barbie. And uh, her notes with her students in architecture and devising what Barbie would wear and what Barbie, the architect Barbie would carry. And there was quite a controversy afterwards. There she is. Uh, as one of our uh, one of the founding advisors on the board, Tony Wren, who was mm -hmm. the AIA archivist, you think mm -hmm. I know him. Uh, and we had these, because there were be people on the board saying, well, we should, uh, we, we need to select which collections to bring in and which not. And Milka was firm, and she said, no, we are not going to make a selection. History can write whatever it needs, but we, us, we're not making a selection. So at that point, Tony said, if Minnie Mouse says she's an architect, we want her archive. <laughs> so, anyway, we, we're open to all kinds of things. We'll find out if space is a problem, we'll work that out. Well, you need an architect. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to end, I think there's just a number of beautiful images, but the idea kind of field of dreams in a certain way. Yeah. But if the material is collected, it's waiting for people to ask questions and to transform that material into history. And I want to thank you both for sharing and giving us a peek into the archive. I hope maybe we'll make a road trip, a couple of people, and we'll go see it. And I'd like to welcome everybody to join us in the reception outside and um, to speak with Donna and Paula individually and to continue the conversation. Thank you.